Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and welcome to Disciplinary Core Idea PS3B. This is on conservation of energy and then energy transfer, especially in the form of heat. And most people understand that energy is conserved. In other words, the amount of energy going into a system is always equal to the amount of energy coming out of a system. And so people understand that. And they also could even cite this, that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. But when I find, if I start asking kids questions about this, a lot, there's a lot of misconceptions related to energy. And so you really want to get this point across to your students that energy is conserved. Energy is conserved in the universe for that matter. And a great place to look at that is when we're looking at collisions and energy transferring collisions. And so if we're looking at the macroscopic or the big level, a great example of this would be in a break. If you're playing pool, when you hit the cue ball and it breaks the other ones apart, the amount of energy that you put into that cue ball is going to be conserved in all of the things that come from that. And likewise, at the microscopic level, if we're looking at chemical reactions, the amount of energy in those molecules before the reaction is going to equal the amount of energy after. And sometimes that energy is going to be released as heat or consumed as well. And so again, energy is conserved and heat is something that's important and an important way to look at that energy transfer. Heat is going to be energy transfer when there's going to be a difference in the object temperatures. In other words, their molecular motion. And so if we have a hot object and a cold object, we're going to see energy transferred from the hot object to the cold object. And how does that occur? Well, it occurs in one of three ways. First way is something called conduction. And so if we have a candle and you want to measure the heat or transfer from some of that heat of the candle to an object, we'll say it's this object right here, in order for it to be conduction, you would actually have to have those objects touching. And so conduction is going to be movement of energy, transfer of energy, when the objects are in direct contact. So if you you touch a burner on a stove, that would be conduction. What about convection? Convection is going to be when the heat is transferred through a fluid or through another uh, medium. And so in this case, if the flame is right here, there's air between the flame and our testing device right here. And so some of that heat is going to be transferred. You don't have to necessarily touch the flame in order to feel some of that heat. If you've ever played with a flame at all, if you put the tester above it as opposed to on the side, it's going to be much hotter above it. And that's because we're heating up the air and hot air is going to rise. And so lots of times you'll hear as convection is like a convection current. And so if we have a pot of boiling water on a stove, it's conduction touching to the stove, but then the movement of that fluid up is going to be convection. And then finally we have what's called radiation. Radiation occurs when we have our testing device and it's separated from our heat source using space. And space, remember, is just going to be emptiness or nothingness, so like a vacuum. And so we also have energy that can move from here to here through radiation. We call that electromagnetic radiation. And so what's an example of that? Well, the sun's a great example of that. So where does the energy, most of the energy on our planet come from? It comes from the sun. How does it get here? It gets, us, gets to us through the emptiness of space. And so we're not directly touching the sun and there's no fluid connecting to us, but radiation can allow it to get here as well. One important thing about radiation is once we, an object picks up that radiation, it can give off heat uh, in the form of thermal energy as well. And so they the heat that we have on our planet was delivered in radiation from the sun, but then it creates heat on our planet. Okay, another thing that's important to understand in, in nature is that systems that are unstable are going to eventually become stable over time. And this is related to energy as well. And so what do we know about water? Water is going to run downhill. And why? That's more stable. In other words, it's moving along this gravitational field. Or if we look at this heat right here, this heat, eventually what's going to happen is that heat is going to be lost and that heat is eventually going to go to the surroundings. It's going to be the same temperature as its surrounding, but it's transferred some of that heat into the surroundings. Or if we look at this train car, what will this train car look like 10 years from now? About the same, but what about a million years or a billion years in the future? Eventually, the whole thing is going to break down. It's going to become a more stable um, system. Uh, over time, but we're still going to conserve energy. And sometimes this takes a huge amount of time for it to occur. And so let me show you what this graph is. This shows us the number of um, 
protons that we have inside an atom. So that's going to tell us what type of an atom it is. And this is going to be the sum of the protons, or excuse me, this is the number of neutrons on this side. And so this is all the atoms on the periodic table. And so the big thing is that as we move up the periodic table, we're getting more protons and we're getting more neutrons. So hopefully this graph makes sense. What do we have over here on the side is we're looking at the half-life. In other words, how long does it take for half of these unstable radioactive uh, isotopes to eventually break down. And you can see that the time scale is incredible. So down here we're dealing with seconds and fractions of seconds, but as we move up and up and up and up, that half-life becomes really, really long. And so even though things might be in an unstable state, in other words, it might be a, a nuclei that's radioactively unstable, it can take billions of years sometimes for that to reach a more stable state. It takes a lot of time. And so that's pretty deep. So let's what should we be teaching our students? Um, step one. If we were in the lower elementary grades, we should simply tell them that the sunlight warms the earth. In other words, something is being transferred from the sun to the earth, and if it weren't for the sun, the earth would get incredibly cold. As we move into the upper levels of elementary, we should talk about where energy is present, and we know that energy is going to be present if we ever have motion, heat, light, and sound. And we could dig in a little bit more deeply in elementary. Um, we could talk about energy present in motion. And so when, uh, the pool analogy is great. And so as we break in pool, the motion of that cue ball is going to be converted to, or the energy of that cue ball is going to be converted to other energies. And so what are some other energies? It's going to be motion of the other balls in that break, but it's also going to make sound. You're going to hear that crack of the breaking and you're going to also generate heat inside there. And what you want your students to understand is the energy we had before is equal to the energy we had at the end. We didn't somehow lose that energy. It's, it's going to be conserved the whole time. And likewise if we look at light, that light and the energy present in the light as it's delivered to our our planet keeps us alive, keeps the earth warm, and it's used, that energy is used by plants to do photosynthesis. And it's also going to generate a certain amount of heat. As we're in the elementary grades, we should also talk about energy present in electrical currents and electricity. And so it's the electricity that's found, you know, as you plug in a fan, that's going to spin that fan. So we're converting that electrical energy into motion of the fan. And likewise, we could have motion of a fan. So if we're making wind power, that could generate electrical currents, electrical energy as well. As we move into me middle school, we want to start talking about energy transfer, energy moving from one object to another. And so if I slide a box across the table, it's eventually going to come to a stop. And why is that? Well, there's a force that's opposing that motion. That's frictional forces that are opposing it. And so what happened to the energy of the box? Well, it didn't go away. It was converted. It was converted into heat on that table as the box slid across it. It was converted into sound energy. And eventually, that energy is going to move off to the environment and be lost as heat. And all energy is eventually going to reach that form of heat. You should also start specifically talking about heat. Heat, again, this transfer of energy from a hot object to a cooler object. And so what determines the rate of that transfer? from an object to its environment? Well, really only three things. The first thing is what type of object that is. And so if it's a metal, it's going to convert more of that, or it's going to lose more of that energy quickly. And so if you grab onto the metal on your desk right now, it's going to feel cold. And why is that? You're feeling the flow of energy from your hand quickly into that metal. And vice versa, if it was really hot, it would be converted really quickly to you. What else is going to determine that, uh, that rate is going to be how big it is. The more size we have in an object, the more heat can be transferred. And then finally, what that environment is made up of as well. So those three things are going to determine the amount of energy and how quickly that energy flows. But how does the energy actually flow? Again, it's through those three ways. It's going to be conduction which is through touch, convection, which is movement of through the fluids or through some kind of a matter, and then finally radiation, which is going to go at the speed of light. Finally, as we get into high school, we want to emphasize the importance of the conservation of energy. In other words, the amount of energy that goes into a system is equal to the amount of energy that comes out of a system. And I'm using that right now. So where does the energy of my motion and the talking and thinking and all of that come from? It came from the food that I ate the breakfast that I had. And where did that breakfast energy came from? It came from the plants and before that it came from the sun. And the amount of energy is going to be conserved. It's not going to be destroyed. It's going to be um, conserved over time.
And then finally, we can kind of start to apply this in different levels. And so if we have a pendulum right here, a pendulum is going to have a certain amount of potential energy up here. And as we let it go, it's going to convert some of that energy into kinetic energy. And then it's going to go back to potential, to kinetic, to potential, to kinetic, to potential. Now this is a magical pendulum which doesn't slow down and so it'll keep going forever. But if we were to really play around with a pendulum in the classroom, it's going to slow down. And why is it going to slow down? It's because we're converting some of that energy into heat. Um, and so we're going to eventually lose some of that energy to the environment, um, but we're going to conserve the amount of energy that we have total. And then the last thing that you want to mention to your students is this idea that things and energy tend to be unstable and reach a more stable uh, state over time. And if we're talking about energy, that eventually ends up as heat. And so if we were to look at this train car, this train car is eventually, all of that order inside it is eventually going to become unordered. But the key thing is students have to understand that sometimes this takes a long amount of time for this to occur. I mean, this is going to look a lot like a, a train car for a long period of time, but that doesn't mean that it won't eventually become a more stable environment when we remove move energy from the system. And so that's energy transfer. It's important and it's most important that your, your students understand the, the uh, conservation of energy and I hope that was helpful.